about a year and a half since we showed anything from The Last of Us Part Two. In that time, we've really been kind of like heads down, quiet, because we want to make sure we have the proper time to do this game justice. It's definitely our most ambitious in scope game that we've ever made. We really wanted to wait until we had something awesome and new and exciting to talk about because we've been so mysterious. Outbreak Day has always been a way for us to communicate with the fans about The Last of Us. It was like the day the outbreak happened in the fictional world of The Last of Us. And once we had this opportunity to line everything up for Outbreak Day, or in this case, kind of an outbreak week, we decided to put out a story trailer with the date of when the game's coming out and then show the press actual gameplay, let them get hands on with the game. We're always trying to strike a balance of getting people excited for this game, show them a bit more of a glimpse of the themes this game is about, the cycle of violence, this idea of how far would you go to exact revenge to bring justice to the people you love. And then we also show that Joel is back and you get to see him for the first time. What the hell are you doing here? You think I'd let you do this on your own? So we're coming into that first demo in winter time where snow covers much of the ground, much of the buildings, all the surrounding areas. We see what's life like 25 years after a pandemic has wiped out most of mankind. Uh, we, we pick up Ellie, who was 14 in the first game, is now 19. She's living in the city, Jackson. Which is where Ellie and Joel have been living for the past four years in this sweet settlement. What we come upon is their regular day-to-day -day life. We're coming in on Ellie and Dina, her best friend, patrolling the outskirts of Jackson, looking for infected to clear out to keep the area safe. Ellie and Dina at this point have been friends for several years, but there's this been underlying romance between these two characters. From the demo we put at E3, where you saw this festival and this dance, and these two characters kissed for the first time, this demo takes place the day after. And then over the course of the level, they encounter some truly dangerous things. We wanted, just across the board, to make the enemies more threatening, to raise the tension that we started establishing with the first game. So that means the infected, even the lowest class, the runners, are more dangerous. Something that was really important to us was empowering all of our characters, right, and making them all equal. Ellie, as we saw in the first game, is incredibly capable, but this is a world where you need to be capable to survive, and we wanted to empower everybody. And the way that reflects in combat is, yeah, Dina is way more effective. So when we have Dina going out, while she may seem the less hardened character, she knows how to use a gun, she knows how to stealth, she knows how to kill a clicker as well as Ellie. When we were looking to expand on The Last of Us 1 to The Last of Us 2, one of the things that jumped out as uh, you know, being an avenue that was really worth exploring was traversal. Ellie is so much more agile, kind of more athletic, that it seemed like we should really pursue this whole avenue of gameplay. Introducing like a real jump, like a real arcing jump, has allowed us to make for much more interesting puzzles, more interesting vertical environments, and can frequently integrate well into combat setups as well. She's able to move quickly in a lot of different ways. She can dodge attacks. She can squeeze through, we call them squeeze throughs. Oh, it looks like I could fit through that. Oh, I can fit through that, that's cool. And that has been such a great integration into the combat loop of like, you're fleeing an enemy or you're trying to get a flank, you're in stealth and you just kind of like scooch into uh, a room or behind an object. In The Last of Us, you kind of rely on your weaponry. Like they're frequently the difference between life and death. They, they're with you for the entire game. Uh, a lot of the gameplay choices that you make are based on how you use them, how you evolve them over time through your upgrades. We really wanted to give an opportunity to look at them up close, to interact with them physically. And so the workbench seemed like the ideal place to do that. I think over the course of the level, just talking about the tech for a second of just a snowy environment, we've got you know, all the deforming snow stuff you'd expect, you know, brushing by on horseback a branch and the snow falling and collecting on the horse, like all these things you would expect in a realistic grounded world. You know, we have this weather, the storm kind of kicks up. Over the course of the level, it goes from more of a clear day into a blizzard. It's all just to build this tension of, you know, the mess that they got themselves into. Can they make it safely out? Dino, where are you? Eventually, they end up 
in this old abandoned library. And it's in this moment where Dino really pokes and wants to get the ball rolling on this flirtation, wants to bring down Ellie's walls. And they kind of reveal to each other how much they like each other. You're infuriating. Have you met you? And then we have a second demo that the press played that's like much later in this story where Elliot started going down this road of revenge. She finds herself in Seattle, um, pitted against this group that controls the city. Called the WLF. Uh, they're kind of a, a little bit like a militia that has taken over the town and they have a very zero tolerance policy on people who are not from Seattle, kind of intruding on their space. And she hears over the radio that a male trespasser has been spotted. And she knows that the WLF are closing in on him. And so we find her negotiating this abandoned hillside suburb. And she's running into this new enemy type of guard dogs that the WLF are using. Dogs have a new sense of perception to bring to the table, which kind of puts this uh, really interesting wrinkle on stealth gameplay, where so far you've been dealing with sight and sound, trying to stay out of sight, trying to move slowly to be quiet. Uh, but now with enemy dogs, you have to worry about them picking up your scent trail. If you go into listen mode, you can see, we have a visualization of that scent, so you can see like when the dog is sniffing you and where it's going. You can throw bottles to distract the dog off of your scent, and it just adds this extra tension. The second part of the demo, even though you're fighting mostly human enemies, we're introducing one of our new infected classes, the Shambler. And the Shambler is kind of a lumbering, tankier enemy that can take a lot of punishment. They'll kind of chase you down and try to get towards you and then burst and leave behind one of these lingering, corrosive clouds. In the demo, we have this mini boss fight, and that class happens to be a stalker. It's a class between runners and clickers. It's a class that can hide and run away, and we wanted to do a lot more with them in this game. And because we have this evade mechanic, you can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone, and we can have these boss fights that we weren't able to have before. So you guys can go back and forth and exchange combos and evade each other and slam each other onto, like, desks, and we, have, we can now render all these physics objects, and it's all done in service of just grounding you more in this world, making you more immersed in this fight and feel like Ellie's barely surviving by the edge of her abilities. So for The Last of Us 2, we've kind of almost completely overhauled the player upgrade system. For the first time in the game, you're able to learn entirely new crafting recipes just via the upgrade system. These are abilities that make your character feel really different. You are really able to pursue the playstyle of, of your choice uh, and kind of make the Ellie that you're playing your individual Ellie. We designed the whole experience to be something where it's a balanced stealth experience where you have a lot of tools to escape. You have a lot of tools to evade. You can entirely stealth past everyone. Got something. We'll look into it. And then the other big thing we did to immerse the player is make the human enemies much more threatening. They communicate a lot more between each other. Their AI is much more sophisticated. We rewrote most of the systems for this game. So much of this game is a conversation about the cycle of violence and how do we make violence feel impactful to the player. You can't stop this. Enemies have names. So when you're going around and you shoot someone, you might hear someone yell their buddy's name and they're now upset and agitated and that changes their behavior. What is it? Someone took him out! Hmm? We got something. To make a fully realized world, to really honor the impact of this violence, you have to honor every person in it. Nobody's a hero here. The demo is two to three hours of the game. You're seeing two different seasons, two different times of the year. It feels like a lot, and it's a tiny fraction of this entire game. And as we get close to release, we're gonna show more and more of the game, but we're gonna be very mindful and conscious to not spoil like big things about this game. And I'm just super stoked for people to finally see the whole thing once it's out on February 21st, 2020.